Awesome. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, th this is a wine explorer introduction to Mexican wines. My name is Rafaela de la Vega, and I am a business development advisor for WSET Americas. And I am thrilled to be sharing the stage with these people today. Today marks Mexico's Independence Day and, you know, Viva Mexico. Uh, so um, the first four months of this year, I had some time to spend in Mexico, kind of traveling around, eating around, um, and just getting to learn a lot about the culture and meeting some really great people throughout. Um, some of the warmest and most talented folks. And I have some of those people with me today. But before I go ahead and introduce them, um, let's just go through some housekeeping rules. So first things first, um, on the right hand side, you should find the chat box. Um, you can go ahead, just send us any comments you have throughout the presentation, any recommendations, if you've had any great Mexican wines or visited some wineries. Um, how are you celebrating today's Independence Day, if that is of significance to you? And of course, we will be posting some polls throughout, so make sure that you are kind of engaging with those as well. If you do have any questions, feel free to put those in the Q&A box. We will be monitoring those and then getting like 15 minutes at the end to give you some answers to those questions. And finally, because it is getting a little bit late for some people, or maybe you have some other things to do, you can always press pause. We will be recording the session and it will be live on YouTube. So now I just wanna give you a little bit of the introduction of the three folks I have with me today. Uh, first off, we've got Gilberto Salinas. Um, Gilberto is based in Tijuana. He is the owner of G Salinas Vinos Negociante. Um, they've been open since 1997 and he is a pioneer when it comes to the commercialization of Mexican wine, um, pretty much creating a symbiotic relationship with a lot of those wineries and you know, has just, have this wealth of knowledge to him. So he is definitely a walking encyclopedia with many stories to share. Would highly recommend having a conversation with him one day. Um, next up is Valentina Garza. She is based in Querétaro City, Querétaro. After having studied in La Rioja and Burgundy, she came back home to Mexico to share her wealth of knowledge with other students. Um, today, she is the director and head educator at the Altiplano Wine School, which provides students with pedagogical opportunities in both the viticultural and winemaking sides. She has recently been named one of the top 25 leaders in Mexican, in just Mexican wine, um, which is extremely amazing. So congratulations. And then lastly, we have Laura Santander, a certified sommelier, as well as a maestra tequilera, a very fun and dangerous combo. Um, she is the owner of Hermitage, found in Mexico City, as well as La Wineria. And she is also brand ambassador for Washington and Oregon wines, bringing some gems over to Mexico for folks to try. She has been involved in several publications and has also had many awards and accolades, both regionally and internationally. So what we're gonna be doing today is we're just gonna walk through a little bit of, you know, the history of Mexican wine, how we got here. Um, Gilberto is gonna walk us through that as well as just an overall view of Baja California. Then we're gonna pass it on to Valentina who's gonna to present to us a little bit more about El Altiplano and those states within that region. And then finally, Laura is gonna finish us off with the emerging region of the state of Chihuahua. Um, alongside that, she will also talk about the consumption within Mexico, as well as some sustainability efforts, and finally, just some future opportunities within the landscape. All right, so let's get to it, y'all. Gilberto, please go ahead. Okay, uh, everybody can hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Hi, well, uh, as, uh, thank you for the introduction. As uh, Rafaela mentioned, uh, we've been involved in the wine, uh, in the growth primarily of wines from Baja California for the past, uh, God, I don't know, more than 20, 20 25 years. Uh, we've grown along with uh, the wine industry here in Baja in essence. But uh, getting back to the essence of this, uh, we, uh, I mentioned primarily Baja California, uh, 
primarily got their first taste of wines with uh, the missionaries who opened uh, all along the Baja California and Northern California uh, missions. And this is going back probably in the six, late 1600s, uh, primarily in, I'd say, 17. 160, 70, more or less. Uh, the Jesuits uh, primarily did uh, their first uh, wines here in, in Baja California. And the first winery that was established as, as a winery was uh, Bodega Santo Tomas, which is uh, it's an ongoing winery uh, currently. It was founded in, 18, in 1888, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, they have been continuously uh, uh, producing wines since uh, those those times, and are currently they uh, they had I think one of the first, if I'm not mistaken, uh, women uh, winemakers working for them, uh, and she uh, worked for them various various years. And now they have a new one, and it's also a woman uh, who's in head of uh, winemaking here in Baja California for Santo Tomas. Uh, the uh, primarily, I'd say, uh, in around 1900s, uh, we had an influx or immigrant immigration of uh, Russians uh, that as exiles from from Russia. Uh, they were primary exiles and they they came and they uh, established themselves in Valle in what is currently Valle de Guadalupe and they brought along with them their customs which were primarily in, in also in in wine and uh, they are still active in producing some of the the old families are still uh, active in producing wines here in Valle de Guadalupe uh, then in, in, in the early, I'd say 20, 1920s, uh, uh, we had some European influx of, of a couple of families here in, in Baja California primarily. And in 1926, 27, some in, in that range of, of years, uh, Bodega Celia Cheto uh, was founded. Uh, and it's still, it's, I consider one of the largest wineries or producers of wine here in overall in Mexico. In, in the late uh, 40s, the first, uh, I'd say, association of uh, wineries uh, was formed, uh, giving it a little bit more formality to the wineries that were uh, involved in, in producing wines here locally. Yeah, this is uh, now coming fast forward. Uh, we've seen in the past, I'd say 10, 15, 15, 10 years back, we've seen a growth in terms of uh, producers, small producers, medium-sized producers coming into, into Valle de Guadalupe and the surrounding uh, valleys, which are uh, mostly in in the south and southeast of the city of Ensenada. To pay, pay, put this into into perspective, Ensenada is about thirty uh, minutes away from the uh, no Ensenada is around forty five minutes away from uh, the border with uh, San Diego, California. So we have a a good number of visitors from from the area, but anyway, uh, getting back to to uh, what uh, initially, as I say, the last fifteen years, we've seen a tremendous growth in terms of of uh, wine uh, pr production here in Baja California, along with an, a good number of small and boutique size wineries. One of the uh, largest challenges that we face currently is uh, the lack or the small amounts of uh, rain water that uh, we have from year to year. And we've seen 
uh, because of that, uh, in primarily in Valle de Guadalupe, because of that situation, we've seen uh, migration of uh, of wineries, uh, not so much wineries, but the vineyards towards other areas in south of Ensenada, primarily in Ojos Negros, which is southeast, uh, and also south of uh, south of Ensenada in uh, San Vicente, Santo Tomas and San Vicente. Uh, San Vicente is a little bit, it's much closer to the ocean breezes. Uh, Ojos Negros is farther away and it, uh, the uh, challenges that they have there is frost. Uh, but we've seen, I've seen a, a, lot, a good a growth of vineyards located in uh, Ojos Negros because of the quality of the water also and the availability of water there. Uh, and the altitude also of uh, Ojos Negros is, is a factor that uh, some of the wineries and vineyards owners prefer uh, because it's at uh, it's around 300 to 400 uh, meters above sea level, uh, where Valle de Guadalupe is uh, around sea level there. Uh, we have a lot of influence from the ocean and as, as you get close to the oceans here where I'm, where I'm currently at, the, at this winery, we're at the entrance to Valle de Guadalupe and, and we're about, I'd say, uh, 10 minutes drive from the ocean. So we do have an influx of, of the ocean breezes. Uh, and also, it, as everybody knows, it helps cool down the vineyards and let them rest in, in, during the night. Uh, we have also a very uh, different types of soils here in Baja California and, and from uh, gravel to uh, canto rodado, which is uh, round stones, uh, round, uh, I'd say river stones primarily, and, and granite, decomposed granite also. And the primary, what we have planted here in Baja California is uh, we produce, uh, in essence, uh, uh, primarily uh, dry white wines, uh, uh, also rosés that have been coming up in terms of quality and acceptance by, in general, by the public. And a uh, good number of, and, and the reds primarily we have a, a re, really a, uh, a whole abanico, how do you say abanico in English? Uh, uh, anyway, abanico is uh, a, a good variety of, of uh, different uh, uh, vineyards and different types of uh, grapes that are being grown here. Uh, primarily, if, as if in general, we have a, a good Cabernet, Chenin Blanc, Merlot Tempranillo, and we also can have a good number of, of plenty of Grenache, Siraz, Mouvert, slightly Mouvert, Carignan also. And uh, then there's a good number of uh, Italian varietals that are grown here, Nebbiolo, Dolcetto, Sangiovese. Uh, so we do have a, a really a, uh, a, you know, a, a broad range of options in terms of, uh, of the types of grapes that you can uh, plant here. And also in terms of the wines that are produced here. We have a, a lot of unique blends because of the of the flexibility that being outside any AOC uh, you can have, so in general we have it, it's we're we're still in a learning curve here in terms of what the best grapes to grow, what the in terms of of the location of the soil and of the climate also. Uh, the biggest challenge, as I mentioned initially, is water, the uh, uh, water and rainfall. It's a very small amounts of water that we get here. In terms of uh, commercial activity, you know, we have a firsthand knowledge in that in terms of uh, when we started uh, back around 20, 25 years ago, we had probably 
I think, 10 wineries in our portfolio. Uh, and currently there's more than 100 producers of 100 wineries producers here in Baja California. Uh, we, we've seen, as I mentioned uh, in my initial comments, we've seen the industry grow. We've seen also the number of, uh, of people and, and, and trying uh, wines from Mexico, which before they were more uh, attuned to buying wines from uh, Spain or with the proximity of the US uh, to wines from California primarily. But now we've seen a, a shift toward uh, more uh, consumption of wines from, Me from Baja California and in general also from, I've seen from, from Mexico, from other states in Mexico, which some of the, uh, the two ladies that will follow will, I think, uh, also uh, put uh, that in this comment into perspective of what's, what they're feeling that's happening currently in the different areas that they work with. Rafael, any comments or additional all good. Yeah, we'll sh we'll share the the questions at the end if there were any okay. that popped up. Um, but you're all set. We'll move it over to Valentina to then walk okay. us through El Altiplano. Thank you, Gilberto. Fine, Valentina, all yours. Thank you, Gilberto, and thank you so much, Rafaela and uh, Charlotte, for inviting me to participate in this amazing webinar to talk about Mexican wine in this. Uh, time of the year, we're celebrating our independence. So I think it's very symbolic and I'm very, very excited to be here. I think anyone who participates in, um, in wine education, once you are invited to participate in any class from uh, WSET, a small part of you says, yes, I've made it. So I'm really excited to be here and well, let's get to it. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the Altiplano wine region in Mexico, and uh, I'm going to focus a lot of viticulture because without viticulture, there's no enology, there's no wine tourism, and I believe it's a big part of um, understanding our region. So uh, if we can get to the first slide, please. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is to uh, let you know where we are situated. We are outside of the well-known wine belt. We are approximately 2,000 to 3,000 kilometers south of the last part of the wine belt. Um, if we can pass to the, to the next slide, you'll understand where exactly in Mexico we are. We are in the same latitude as Cancun. We are the southernmost region of the Northern Hemisphere. And it would be unthinkable to uh, think of Cancun as a wine region. I don't think there's anyone crazy enough to plant vineyards in Cancun or in the Caribbean. However, it is possible to have a very good wine producing regions in the center of Mexico in this Altiplano because of our altitude. We are situated uh, approximately 2000 kilometers uh, above sea level which makes the big difference between the uh, center of the country and Cancun, the Caribbean. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our climate. Um, if we can, yeah, about the, the altitude. This is the Alti Altiplano, okay? So we are uh, five different states which combine into one wine region. So this is Zacatecas, San Luis Potosí, Aguascalientes, Guanajuato, and Querétaro. The lowest uh, vineyard in this Altiplano region is planted in 1,800 meters above sea level, and the highest one is about 2,200 meters above sea level. So if we compare ourselves to um, I don't know any other typical wine region in the wine belt, for example, Rioja, uh, we wouldn't think about planting vineyards any higher than 600 meters, right? So this is more than doubling the height of any normal uh, wine region in the, in the wine belt. 
Uh, that's why we talk about extreme viticulture when we talk about the Altiplano region. Um, so this is the region in round numbers. And there's something I would like to, to share with everyone uh, here. We're not exactly a new wine region because there's a lot of tradition since the Spanish uh, conquest in, in Mexico. Um, however, once we started producing a lot of wine, the Spanish king asked uh, to um, burn down all the vineyards in the region because they stopped selling wines here in, in Mexico, like they're Spanish wines. So most vineyards were burned down and we had to start over again. So this is like the second era of, of our wine tradition and wine uh, industry in Mexico. And the first, the first vineyards were planted here in the Altiplano region. Um, so since we're starting over again, we're not sure exactly what we have, where the vineyards are planted, and uh, we don't really know uh, the exact numbers. So I'm just gonna give you some general ideas of what we have and, and where they are, okay? So we have approximately 850 hectares of vineyards in Zacatecas, 500 in Querétaro, 400 in Aguascalientes, 300 um, in, sorry, 300 in Aguascalientes and 200 in San Luis Potosí. That's a total of uh, 2,250 hectares in the Altiplano region. And in terms of projects, and uh, I'm referring to projects as vineyards or wineries or, or the combination of both. We have four projects in Zacatecas, 40 in Querétaro, 30 in Guanajuato, 30 in Aguascalientes, and five in San Luis Potosí. So the wine school uh, is working with um, Arkansas State University, which has a campus in Querétaro, to do a real census of the region. And via satellite, we're uh, trying to get the exact number of projects and hectares to be able to give uh, a, a more uh, exact idea of what we have in, in the region, okay? So this is more or less what we know we have, okay? Um, if we can get to the next slide, please. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our um, climate. So the Altiplano has a semi-desert semi climate, um, which is very unique for, for our viticulture. We have very, very harsh suns, okay? So if you spend a whole day on the beach, you'll probably get a uh, light sunburn depending on your skin type and the protection you use. But if you spend two hours in the sun in Querétaro, you will get a very bad sunburn. I mean, the, the sun here is really very, very harsh, which allows us to develop very thick skins in our grapes. Uh, the grape protects itself like this every year. so. We get very good polyphenols. We get very good structure, amazing um, aromas. Uh, however, we do not consider uh, the Altiplano region to be a warm climate. Uh, so we do not get very much alcoholic um, degrees, uh, very high degrees uh, here. Our White wines round, uh, are around 11, 12 degrees. Our reds are between 13 and tops 14. So uh, we do not have very alcoholic uh, wines in our, in our region. So we get very subtle aromas and very elegant wines. The day and night thermal differences are extreme. Like we can get uh, as much as 15 degrees Celsius differences between day and night. And that allows us to have a very paused um, maturity of the grapes. We have also very foggy mornings and clear blue skies during the day, which means we have a lot of humidity at night. And then during the day, this dissipates uh, completely. So this allows us to have a very paused uh, harvest season. We have enough time to harvest the grapes for uh, our sparkling wine and then the white wine and then the reds for rosé and then uh, till the end we, we leave the, the reds for the red wine. We have very dry winters and springs. We have humid summers which uh, are a bit controversial because uh, 
uh, we've not been able to communicate this as, as we should. Um, our humid summers uh, mean that we, we have a rainy season uh, during, during harvest. And it's been hard for us to understand how to manage this, but we're learning year by year. And I think we've, we've managed to know what varieties can, um, can with, withstand these harsh um, rains during, during our harvest season. And thanks to our thick skins, we also have um, a pretty healthy uh, uh, harvest. We have mild and quick falls, we have a maximum temperature of 34 degrees during our hottest um, uh, peak and minus four degrees during winters. We have 570 millimeters of annual rain, uh, but th it, it's a bit tricky because it doesn't rain throughout the year. It only rains during our summer. So uh, it's very concentrated rain in just one or two months. And our harvest season is August and September. So this is very particular to our region. We have an inverted spring and summer. So we don't have the spring like we, we usually uh, study uh, in school, like with the birds chipping and the rain and the flowers. Spring is actually our most dry season. It is incredibly dry, uh, so we have to um, to water the the vineyards. Um, most vineyards are are watered like like in the picture. Um, however, our summer is not that uh, hot of a season. Not like the spring. The spring is dry and very very hot, and our summers are more mild but humid. So we have uh, winter summer, spring, and then fall. Okay, so we have this, this very particular uh, rainy season in our, during our summers. Um, this dry um, spring allows us to have a very respectful, uh, respectful viticulture, which means very few treatments are needed in our vineyards. Uh, we consider our, our viticulture to be almost organic, although we are not certified. Um, however, this means that there is a lot of uh, activity from different animals in our vineyards. We have a very healthy ecosystem, uh, which has forced us to have forcefully nets in our vineyards. There are two reasons why. The first one is hail. You can see two pictures in, in the bottom of the slide of this tragic 2014 hail in, in different vineyards. Obviously, the whole crop was, uh, was lost that year. It was very sad, very tragic. So it hails every year, not as bad as in the pictures, but we learned the hard way that it was necessary to have these vineyard nets to protect from uh, the grapes from the hail. And then also the, the thing about being in a semi-desert and with very healthy ecosystem is that the grapes, these juicy uh, grapes are very attractive for the animals that live uh, in, in, the, in nature and we, we coexist with them. So uh, they have these two options of eating the, the very small and, and, and not very uh, common fruits from the cactuses that are around or they can attack the juicy grapes from our vineyards. So without the net, birds, bees, bats, and wasps attack our, our vineyards and we would lose the crop. So I think that in Querétaro, probably more than 90% of the vineyards are protected by vineyard nets, which is a big investment. But uh, since we, we use the nets, we can definitely sense the difference in, in the quality of our wines. On the other hand, wine tourism is also very important in our wine region. We are located two hours north a drive uh, from Mexico City, which means 50% of uh, Mexico's population lives around 
250 kilometers around our region, which means it makes uh, the perfect weekend escape uh, to get away from the crowds, from to get away from uh, the rush and the traffic and the stress of our city. So we have in, in Querétaro the wine, cheese and art route, uh, which, it, which receives more than 1 million tourists a year. And also Freixonet is located in our, in our, um, in our region uh, since the 80s. And well, it's one of the most visited uh, wineries in the world. I think it's the number five uh, uh, winery uh, in terms of visits. And thanks to their 3 million bottles a year projection, Querétaro uh, is known as Mexico's bubble. I think there was a poll around there that asked um, what uh, type of one wine was famous in our region. And the correct answer is sparkling wine. So the Altiplano region is an incredible potential uh, producer in bubbles. We love sparkling wine and we love parties and we love uh, receiving people. So uh, these harvest parties have become a tradition in our, in our region. There's always a traditional wine stomping or stepping and uh, they've become also a great scenario to get um, together and know a little bit more about our gastronomy and just to get a little bit um, more around to our to our potential clients, which are obviously very important for uh, the development of a healthy wine region. So this was a little bit about uh, the Altiplano region. I know we're on a tight schedule, so I'm going to get uh, to let Laura Santander uh, talk to you a little bit more about another amazing wine region in Mexico. Thank you again for this space. I'm very proud to be here and sharing this this uh, this uh, webinar with Gilberto and Laura Santander. Thank you so much for the invitation and I hope you guys come and visit us soon. Mexico will always be your house and happy Independence Day. Laura. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Valen. Like, I'm really, really glad to share this webinar with two friends and talented friends. So let's start. We're gonna talk about the biggest state in Mexico. So in, in our country, in Mexico, we have 31 states, well, 30 states and Mexico City. So we're gonna talk about Chihuahua. And uh, I'm, I'm going to repeat that again because with it has a lot of letters in that name. So the correct name is Chihuahua. So Chihuahua, it's the biggest state in Mexico. So when I'm talking about the biggest state in Mexico, I'm, I'm going to show you some examples because we're talking about uh, 247,000 square kilometers. Like it's bigger, it's bigger than UK, like the whole UK, uh, countries like Uruguay, uh, Greece, Nicaragua, uh, North Korea, South Korea, uh, Cuba, Iceland. So it's a really big region. So uh, we only have um, a little bit um, uh, of time to talk about this one region, but I'm going to start. Um, can, can we go back to the other slide? Because um, I'm going to talk about this one region that has these two poles. Like it's a really uh, big uh, desert and all the wine regions in, are in the semi-desert part. And also we have really high altitudes and there we have our famous world known uh, train that's called Chepe that whenever you go to Chihuahua, you have to go to that train because it's amazing. So and we, we were seeing at the other slide that um, all, all the, all the, the region, it's amazing. You have to come here because in, so, since this is such a, a huge state, we have different things going on. And let's see in the map, where are we located? Because we are going to see that we are just in the border with a United States. And there you see Chihuahua, the other part, it's another state called Sonora. And the other one, it's Coahuila. And in Coahuila, we have 
all the dinosaurs uh, going on over there. So uh, we'll, we'll stay in Chihuahua. And why is Chihuahua so important for us, for Mexicans? Let's, let's just go back in history. So we have uh, human remains were found here in this state just 7,000 uh, years before Christ. So this is really important for us because uh, here we have the caves, we have a lot of history that it's really important for the Mexicans. So let's uh, make a zoom in the other slide and let's see where we are. So we, we're here in Mexico and then we're going to zoom in and we're going to go to the north in Chihuahua. And then you will see that just in the border, we are going to have El Paso, that's um, the, the main border with Ciudad Juarez. And this is really important because we have a lot of knowledge from the United States and all of our culture from Mexico. So that, that is where Chihuahua is located. And whenever you come to Mexico, you need to go there. But let's talk about a little bit more of history because of the missions. So, um, Valen and Gilberto were telling us that the Spanish came to Mexico and they started to, to plant vineyards everywhere. Well, everywhere, mostly in the northern part, in the Altiplano and the northern part. But how did they start to plant all these vineyards? Because and through the missions, through the missionaries. So in Chihuahua, it, we used to have 283 missions, mostly from different orders uh, and from Franciscans and Jesuits. So uh, you can see here in, here in the pictures and well, 283, there are a lot of missions and they were planting lots and lots of vineyards. But the first one was in 1611 and was the mission of San Pablo. But probably you're thinking like, what, why do we want to have these missions? Why are they useful? Because they were talking about religion. And through Catholic, Catholic religion, we only had the opportunity to have more wine. And also we, uh, we use these missions to have uh, a lot of important things. One of it was they had land to work, to provide uh, work to all the people that were living there. That might, so might sound uh, fun and interesting, but it was more or less like slavery. So it was not as, as good as it sounds, but well, they have land and they provided work for people. Also, they gave food. And of course, the first wines were through the, uh, these missions and also they have olive oil. One of the first waves that were planted in this part of the country was the great uh, Mission that probably you've heard, like it's also uh, has a name of Pais or also uh, Listan or Criolla. So it has different names and different roots, but uh, we can say that we had Mission here. And afterwards, we, we also had the opportunity to have plantings of a Vitis vinifera grape. So that's when it all started. So the next slide, please. So that, that was in the past, but uh, if we talk about Chihuahua, we have to talk about how is it actually, because as Valentina was saying, like we are used to have vineyards in our country because we have like these, uh, these burnings of the vineyards, but now we can talk about the actual, uh, the actual reality of the home industry in the country. So we are like, we're not brand new, but we are modern to this industry. So in 1935, we had like this reactivation of the whole vineyards in the country, and mostly they were made for brandy production because probably Valentina's and Gilberto's father and also my, my parents, they were really good drinkers of brandy because we Mexicans do like alcohol and we do like brandy and tequila also. And uh, the prohibition it damaged a lot of that industry. So we also had a prohibition in our country and it was terrible because it damaged that brandy industry and that obviously damaged also all the, all the plantings. But as we all know, in every prohibition, we had uh, another opportunities and we started to produce 
um, clandestine whiskey, and also Sotol. And I'm talking in this part of the northern part of the country. Sotol, it's a really important spirit in Mexico, in the north part, and it's amazing. You should have, uh, you should try it whenever you come to Mexico because it's amazing. So uh, when everything restarted in 1950, the government had the amazing idea to have these irrigation systems in al almost all, all, all of the important parts of the state. That was really important because now we had the opportunity to have new plantings, new vineyards, and also we had more cactus plantings. Let me talk about cactus because cactus, they are really important, but they are not, um, not the best plantings talking about water because when you have a cactus planting you you use the double as when you use it for the vineyards so we love to have vineyards and that's important for for our industry so when the irrigation systems were ready a lot of families started to make uh, more wineries and started to make more plantings. So that's why they went to different universities and they, they started to specialize in all the industry. And that's why uh, in the United States, you had as students, a lot of, of um, families from Chihuahua that went to study over there so we can have more plantings and more quality wines. And obviously this make the wine tourism, tourism started. So if you are planning to go to Chihuahua, you have to have a couple of weeks of free time and a really fast car because you will need to cover all these huge states and obviously you will have lots of fun. So uh, what's uh, Chihuahua's uh, wine region? So a lot of territory. Um, 24.7 million hectares, so almost as half Spain's territory. And we also have high altitudes as in the Altiplano. So we're from 800 to um, 2,200 uh, uh, meters above sea level. And we have the, the, the low altitude regions. They are popular, but not as popular as the, as the high altitude. So our main grapes are Cabernet, Sauvignon, Syrah, Tempranillo, Malbec, Chardonnay, Malvasia, and Gebustraminer. Those are the main grapes for Chihuahua. For Chihuahua. And also talking about climate and weather, here you can see, um, probably uh, you will see like just in the pink yellow part, that we are in a semi-desert semi place where it's pretty hot. Also, you will need a really good jacket in the night and you will be needing a, a light clothes in, in during the morning because it's a high difference between the night and day. So uh, it's perfect for our vineyards. And uh, then you will see that also we have in the next slide, this um, range of elevation. So we are in a really high altitude place talking about all the vineyards and that's how you can see it. But one of the most important parts is the zones. So in the next slide, you will see that we have wine uh, regions and wine different zones. So we had a Winkler made uh, uh, Winkler made this classification so we can have more knowledge about this wine region and they divided it in five zones. So the first zone, it's a high altitude and it, it's the best part for planting the vineyards. They have like the best temperature. They can plant Carmener, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, and it's uh, above 2000 meters above sea level. So it's a great zone where to plant our vineyards. And then we have the zone number two, that it's the one in green, that it has all the inland valleys and it's a semi-desert. So we have um, soils of sand and clay and they have really cold autumns and springs. So this is also an important part. And also the zone three, that it's the hottest one of all. And we have low acidity wines, but we have sweet, amazing wines that you have to try. So that's, that's like something that you have to, to try when you come here. And for the Sun 4, we have low amount of water. So we are suffering a little bit over there. And for Sun 5, 
uh, we have um, also the all, all the valleys have uh, they are great because they have a lot of difference between day and night. So more than 60% than of Chihuahua's territory can have plantings of Vitis vinifera. So we have a lot of room to, of room to grow vineyards. And the next one, please. Here you can see just how hot it can be. So we have a, a lot of high temperatures. And also uh, for the next one, you can see where do we have our rain? So it's a little bit complicated because we have all our rain, we have it just in the harvesting season. So that's important, that's difficult, but I think that people are getting used to it and they are amazing wines over there. Thank you to this, um, this type of, of water during these type of months that are the harvesting months. So that's an interesting thing about this uh, wine region. And uh, hours of daylight, you will see the comparison in the next slide between Walla Walla and Chihuahua. You will see that we're not as far as Walla Walla in Washington, Oregon, but uh, in comparison with Chihuahua, we have a lot of uh, hours of daylight. So what are the styles of the wines of Chihuahua? Just a... a a, a quick tour, you have to try the wines from Sierra de Encinillas that they have the best, well, not the best, the highest production. And uh, all the five zones have different styles of wine. And obviously we have wines of really high quality. And why do we have to try these wines? Because, and why is it so special? Because it's a frontier in Mexico. We are in a new and exciting wine region for enotourism, and we're still exploring and growing, and it's amazing. And you know what I was talking about, vines and cactus, and also they are a team. All the wine producers in Chihuahua, in Chihuahua are working as a team, so that's amazing. And um, we're going to do a brief tour about Mexican wine industry. and. Uh, what is it about Mexico? Why, why is it so important? Why is uh, the reason that today we're having a webinar about Mexican wine is because of this? Because we have uh, 14 wine growing states and we are producing more than 7 million cases. That means that we're doing a lot of wine. Well, a lot of wine for us that we are an emerging country production uh, in wine. And we offer with this industry more than a half a million jobs. So that's really important because it's the second most important um, activity talking about agricultural activities. And obviously we have uh, won thousands and thousands of medals in all the wine contests around the world. And let's see what's uh, about numbers in Mexico. So we are producing 27 tons of grapes and consumers in Mexico are changing daily. Actually, women, we women are consuming 55% of wine. So Valentina, Rafaela, and I were doing an excellent job here. And we're drinking fresh, young, aromatic wines. We're also really full feeling uh, mouth wines that are really like big wines. And since uh, 2017, Mexican consumers prefer Mexican wines. And uh, they share the 30% of the market share. And in 15 years, we have been doing a really good job, I think we can do it better, but we started drinking 180 milli, uh, milliliters. And now we're drinking over one liter per year, but we hope that in three years, we will be drinking three liters per year. So all the Mexicans are, that are in this webinar, you should help everybody and drink more wine. And we are only exporting 5% of our production. And with these amazing numbers, that's why we are hosting this year the 43 World Congress of Vine and Wine. And we are honored to share with the world our abundant agriculture, vineyards, wine, and all the scientific studies to uh, related to this sector. So um, why? Because our country, was the first one in America in wine graping cultivation. So we have the first winery in America. So 
we have to show everybody what we're doing. And of course, um, talking about sustainability, we're trying to make a lot of efforts. Somebody was asking about what's going on in the north part of the country in Valle de Guadalupe and this wine region that Gilberto was talking about. Like we are really in, a, in we're making a really big effort. And I think I, incl I include myself because we are all really worried about what we can do to uh, protect the little reserve of water that we have in that part of the country. We are trying to, to keep away all the um, activities that are not um, of and for this wide region uh, away so we can have a Valle Guadalupe that will last us for years and years and years. So obviously we have some wineries that are making their best effort, effort to have biodynamic vineyards. And also they are using um, different types of um, animals to take care of the vineyards. So um, not, not everybody is as lucky as the guys in, a, in Antiplano like Valentina was saying that they, were, they are almost organic, but believe me, everybody is trying to make sustainability a really important issue in Mexico and everybody's trying our best to, to do it better every day with technology, with knowledge, and also with help of all the friends that we have in the world that can give us, uh, gives us their knowledge and their passion to take care of our incredible wine industry that we have in Mexico. So whenever you have the time to come to Mexico, please visit us. We will be thrilled to have you here to taste our wines. Uh, hopefully we could send wine all over the world. But mean, meanwhile, you should come to Mexico, visit us, and for sure, you will always have somebody that will receive you here and always with a good glass of wine, of Mexican wine. And as Valentina said, Happy Independence Day to everybody. Thank you. Great, thank y'all so much for, for all this great knowledge that you just shared with us today. I feel like I definitely took a lot from this myself. Um, I'm seeing the chat just glow up as my computer has been sharing. So I'm really looking forward to looking at all of the comments that everyone has to say. Um, we're quickly just gonna look through some Q questions. Um, so I'll read through through some of these. I know we're, we're down to the last eight minutes, so we'll go by quick. Um, hello, I lived in Mexico for six years and have had the pleasure of tasting delicious Mexican wines. Why are they not distributed to the US? Casa Madero is the oldest winery in North America. Does someone want to take that one? Go for it, Laura. So um, now there is a brand new importer in the US that's called La Competencia, that it's um, the competence. And uh, they are bringing fabulous and amazing Mexican wines to the, to the US. So maybe you should look for them because they are doing a great job with Mexicans and with Mexican wines from different wine regions. Can I, can I share something as well? Um, okay. Mexican wine is only uh, uh, completing 30% of the market's demand. So there's not enough Mexican wine to go all around the world. So if one of the participants is willing to come and invest in Mexican wine, now's the time. <laughs> nice, awesome. All right, can you please speak a little about the Fiesta de la Vendimia in Ensenada? How has that impacted the wine industry in general in the area and what wineries participated this year? Roberto, do you have, do you have some? Oh, you're on mute. Gilberto, activa tu micrófono, por favor. Okay. There we go. <laughs> There's another importer of Mexican wines located uh, domicile in San Diego. Um, it's, uh, they've been doing this, I think, in, uh, for some time now, and they carry some of uh, a, a very good portfolio of, of wines from Baja California here locally. Uh, it's, uh, uh, ¿cómo se llama la muchacha? Michelle. Michelle Martin, uh, 
uh, who is the daughter of Fernando Martin, who has a winery also here in, uh, in Ensenada called Balmar. And she has, uh, a, a, she's been importing uh, wines from Baja for some time also, primarily in the San Diego area, LA area. And there's another gentleman, I, I forgot his, uh, the name, but he's Thomas Adler, I think in Washington. Seattle. In Seattle, Washington also. Base, base of wines. Best, uh, best of like kiss, best of wines. Okay. Awesome, great. And do you do you have anything to speak about the Fiesta de la Vendimia in Ensenada, Gilberto? Yeah, well, Any... yes. Uh, primarily, we this past uh, Fiesta de la Vendimia, we've seen uh, uh, some events a little bit more intimate, more more uh, smaller smaller events than uh, than in the past years primarily uh, it's uh, and normally the largest one is uh, of the events is the paella uh, competition and uh, I went to this year's in my perception it was uh, more uh, better organized much better organized than the, in, in previous years and also a smaller number <laughs> of uh, a guest, which uh, makes it more orderly, which is one thing that uh, in, in Valle, we are, there's stri we're striving for to, to have uh, more intimate uh, events rather than massive uh, events. And, and uh, to primarily uh, just to uh, have a good, contact with the people who are attending that they go away with a, a good experience of, of really what the event is about which is primarily wine food and uh, being to, and sharing the wines and sharing the experience great well hopefully whoever asked that question will will make their way over to Ensenada soon for that Oh, um, one, <laughs> one question that came up that I think is, is an interesting one is, is there any talk about the Mexican government passing consolidated wine laws, or is it up to the states to regulate if they are doing that at all? Does someone have think, an answer to that? Uh, ladies, any comment on that? I, I think Valentina is the one that has more uh, actual information. <laughs> we are working uh, as a team. Uh, through the school and through the wine association in Querétaro and uh, through the Mexican Wine Council uh, and the government to regulate the industry, uh, not to limit it, but more to, to promote it in a correct way, like, like good use of water, good use of uh, viticulture practices, and to have really clear information about where the wine is coming from and to have good hygiene practices and very clear and honest information on the wine labels. So it's something new, we are working on it, but it's, it's a work in progress. There's still a lot to be done. Uh, yes, I agree with you completely. There's a lot to be done primarily, uh, but it, it, each step that's taken uh, in the right direction is, is uh, very good, I think. And also it's, I think, very important to give credit as we, it, meant, it has been mentioned, give, give credit to uh, to the vineyard, to the to the source of the wine, which is the vineyard, the vineyard owner, uh, Bebo, in placing that on the back label, uh, being more uh, more clear on from what vin what vin vineyard the wine. The, the grapes come from for that specific uh, wine and giving credit to, to the uh, people who work the, uh, who work the uh, vineyards is very important, I think. Awesome. Great, um, I know we, we have so many questions. I'm just gonna take, oh, we've reached time actually. So if you had a question, I am gonna make sure that we copy these questions and we can get you some answers. Um, we'll figure out how to post some of this information, but I do see some re repeated questions in here. Um, we do have, you know, awesome speakers with us today. If you have 
any questions whatsoever for them, I'm sure they are willing to have a conversation with y'all. They're great to follow on Instagram. Um, if y'all have any questions regarding anything, please feel free to reach out to WSET correct or directly. Um, this will be posted on YouTube again, um, just to reiterate that. So if you want to go back and check out the just the, the recording, you can always go over there. We do have some couple of webinars coming up soon. One of them will be next Thursday regarding mezcal. So if you're more on the spirit side, um, you can definitely go ahead and check us out there next Thursday. And if you could please fill out the feedback form that just popped up, that would be excellent, just so we can get a good grasp of, of how engaging this was for y'all and if you're more interested to learn, to learn some more. All right. <laughs> Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to the speakers for joining us today. You all did an incredible job of, of sharing your knowledge with us and just giving us a snippet of, of where you're coming from and what you're trying to engage the world with. Um, but I am so honored to be here with y'all and Viva Mexico. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you, Rafaela, Laura, Gilberto. It was an honor sharing the stage with you. Thank you so much. And I hope we can drink some wine together during the, the OIB conference. See you guys soon. Yes. You can uh, stay Thanks. tuned and uh, follow us under our username, the uh, gsalinas.enoteca. We're going to have the uh, live with Christophe here in 30 minutes. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Awesome. All right. Bye. 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 Have a good one. Bye. bye.